And that's really the Thanks, Megan. Um, and that's really looking at that first draft and gathering that feedback um, and then um, bringing that all together and then working through that strategic leadership group as well. Um, conversation that we have with them on May 19th to start bringing all of this information together um, and then providing a second draft uh, to y'all May 24th, all those refined comments, et cetera, um, and uh, sending that out as well and then hoping to have comments back by June 2nd. So two touch points on this and then also within some of the future, uh, within the next uh, stakeholder meeting that we have as well is really focusing in on uh, that written draft, that report um, within that conversation. So just wanted to lay this out there. I laid out uh, some of it in the email. Um, once again, we'll throw out uh, these slides on the <clears throat> on the webpage um, if you need these dates, but um, just wanted to remind folks that that's the, that's the trajectory we're heading on and uh, going from there. So, um, any thoughts, comments on that? Um, that's kind of the update that I had, and I'll also open up the floor if anyone else has uh, updates that they want to throw out there. So I'll just go ahead and pause for a second. I have a question for you, Nathan. Yep. Um, once all this is done, the, the plan is developed, uh, then what happens with it? And um, how should we expect it to show up in policy conversations, funding conversations, implementation on the ground, what should we expect? Yeah, that's that's really good. So kind of a couple, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of a couple thoughts here and next step. So one of them is um, looking at what are some um, kind of key elements moving into implementation and kind of refining some of the work and continuing to do the work. We talked a lot about decision support. Um, really working on some of that work, refining the governance. I think last uh, time we talked about kind of what is the future of this group. Um, so continuing those conversations about refining that. Um, and then, um, you know, working on different aspects of accomplishment tracking and all of that to hopefully have, you know, tangible information um, that we can can use into the future and the report hopefully um, laying that out. Um, so, uh, you know, really the desire to move into implementation and then um, within the report looking at, uh, you know, conversations we've had here in other groups of how implementation will happen um, in kind of our thought process behind it. And hopefully that report will lay some of that out. So I'll also open it up for any kind of other thoughts or comments to answer that question um, and, and feedback from you all too of what, you know, needs are for yourself as well. So Ryan, I see you may have something there. Yeah, I, I've just, uh tag on and um, say that uh, I kind of think about two kind of two sides of this. One, um, I've really been thinking about the 20 year strategy as really the strategic plan for implementation of shared stewardship in Oregon. Um, and so that's really where I see the, the glossy document, if you will, um, going. Um, on the other side of that, it's, you know, Clearly, uh, with all the work that we've collectively done in this group and in others, um, we've identified, um, <clears throat> reorient myself here to the- Sorry about basis. that. That's all right, it's perfect, it's, it's easier. Um, we've, we've collectively identified um, a lot of needs um, and we can't make all those investments at once and we gotta take them in bite-sized pieces. And so, and Nathan alluded to that as well. I think some of the initial priorities for us are to think about uh, decision, the development of decision support tools, um, some of the um, track metrics tracking and reporting, um, I think kind of on the mechanical side, if you will, those are really important and valuable for um, the collective work that we're all doing here and all the state and federal agencies are doing. Um, I think there's also a lot of uh, need for continued development and investment and engagement. Um, you know, we've really just started to scratch the surface, um, I think, in terms of tribal engagement um, in engaging with uh, the local collaborative groups that are getting this work done, um, et cetera. So I'd, I'd see uh, continued investment and time um, there as well. So I don't know if that, uh, if that is uh, helpful, but just trying to kind of hang a few more ornaments on the tree, if you will. Yeah, Pete. Yeah, it's somewhat of an extension on SJ's question, and maybe Ryan or you can elaborate on it. Um, but just wondering what ODF's thinking is about how you might 
proactively go about, or if you plan to proactively go about showing up in session with this plan as a communication tool for sort of ODF's thinking, this, and, and more broadly, maybe, you know, this stakeholder body's thinking, the state leadership group's thinking on the, you know, the, the, the value to the state of Oregon taxpayer dollars of these investments, um, you know, to the extent that this does communicate, like you're saying, Ryan, a strategic plan for shared stewardship. Uh, you know, I, I know this is something where TNC in particular, we're interested in making sure we're making a compelling case for further investments and leveraging federal dollars, et cetera. Um, seems like this plan has always been geared towards doing that, but I mean, I, I think we have to sort of get there and start showing up with it. But I know the timing, as I just saw Nathan's slide, is, you know, it's not exactly perfect for showing up this session. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's really it. The timing is a real challenge for us um, on that account. And definitely, uh, Nathan and I have definitely had a lot of conversations around that. Um, and, and to a certain extent, um, that's the situation that we've had to that we've had to work with. Um, we're we're going to be in a, I think in a, in a great place for the twenty five session, um, which I know is is uh, not helpful for what's in front of us right now. Um, I would like to think that some of the interim products that have been produced from this effort have been helpful. I know I've shared some things with other folks, um, and we've had a few opportunities to um, provide some of those down at the legislature this session. Um, but in terms of, you know, really uh, rolling this out and having an impact in session, uh, we're already too late for that in many respects. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Really appreciate that. Other, other thoughts, comments? All right, and we'll just open it up for any other updates as well, if anyone else has information they want to share before we, we jump into the, the main show here. But uh, any other any other kind of thoughts, comments, um, anything that people want to throw out there? All right, excellent. Well, thank you. Um, so I'll just kind of jump into the next piece of it to kind of keep us on track for the conversation. So um, what we wanted to look at next was uh, priority geographies and kind of where we currently are sitting with the mapping products, et cetera, um, and kind of the additional information that we pulled together um, and refined over, over all these conversations. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and we got 30 minutes. I got some maps that we'll look at, kind of talk about the process, get any feedback, comments, thoughts, et cetera. And, um, kind of go from there. So we'll start with, oops. so just kind of a, a look at of the process that we went through with um, where we're currently landing and, and how we're um, thinking about refining um, this work as well. So um, kind of when we looked at the criteria from the beginning, really starting with the data and, and starting off with the uh, quantitative wildfire risk assessment and looking at those uh, top four ENVC classes, um, understanding what is the overall wildfire risk. And a lot of initial conversations that uh, we had in this group and other groups was to bring in that landscape health um, priorities as well, and how to kind of integrate the, the two of them together. Um, but then also understanding that there's a lot of um, existing work, project areas, priorities, um, the proximity to the WUI, and really um, thinking about this work um, in those areas, and then also local plans, expert opinions, and, and where we've seen wildfires in the past. So, um, and then looking at what is that short-term priority geographies, understanding there's a lot of wheels in motion and a lot of work happening, and really thinking about where those short-term priority geographies are, and then the desire for the longer-term decision support and understanding how we can uh, look into the future with some of that work as well, um, and continue to um, think about this as a, a very dynamic product over time. So um, really starting with there and wanted to start with that uh, kind of background, the criteria and where we are with that, et cetera. So um, jumping into 
The next piece of it, um, you know, we had landed in these areas previously and then uh, made some refinements with the wilderness areas, the roadless areas, um, and kind of the information that uh, folks had given um, within these refinements, et cetera. And then how we broke that up into um, the land management, the land ownership, and you can see the breakup of, of, of all of this work as well. And this really has propelled future conversations uh, within regional engagement and working with regional folks. Um, and just kind of a, a background on that is um, following up with the collective action groups or the partnerships, uh, all lands partnerships and forest collaboratives and, um, you know, having those conversations, understanding where those local priorities are, where um, those projects are, those uh, 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 current areas where they're focusing on, et cetera, and getting some of that information and uh, understanding that throughout the state. So it's been very fruitful conversations and and uh, looking at some of that work. So uh, where we currently are with um, thinking about areas that we really want to focus on these priority geographies. So just starting there and then um, thinking about overlaying that with um, some of the other information. So looking at where are those uh, fire perimeters, um, that we've seen over the last 20 years, where we've seen these large fires, et cetera. Um, and then also bringing that into um, where are those ignition locations, but understanding where are those fires that are over uh, 20,000 acres. Um, so really pulling in that information and that data and understanding, okay, um, where are these large fires, um, et cetera. So I uh, wanted to kind of throw that out there of kind of refining where are those fire perimeters um, and then also the proximity to the WUI, really adjusting from that original data and understanding um, where is the proximity to the WUI, the high risk um, and extreme risk, and how we're looking at at uh, working um, around the WUI and, and really thinking about the landscape resiliency aspect of the strategy and really supporting uh, what are the other two legs of the COESA strategy, one of them being that uh, community resiliency and also the safe and effective fire response aspect of it. So. Um, understanding uh, the proximity to the WUI and how that data is really um, informed in all this information. And then also um, looking at what were past projects, uh, priorities, et cetera. And we had shown this before with FFR and the LRP, the $20 million to Senate Bill 762, um, and where we've been looking at good neighbor authority, et cetera, and, and plotting some of that information with, with these maps as well. So Looking at that and really um, kind of expanding on previous maps that we've seen with the current uh, US Forest Service, the fire sheds um, and getting new data and new data is coming at us uh, pretty regularly. And one of them being the, the Joint Chiefs um, as well, um, the, the 2023 Joint Chiefs that we just plotted on these maps, et cetera. So uh, Marco, I see your hands raised. I can't see others, but uh, Marco, I got you. If you got a question or a comment, please. Yeah, just a comment and, and Perhaps it's in the slides, maybe I'm jumping the gun here, but um, there's quite a bit happening with stewardship authority as well. And I know good neighbor is more of an authority with o ODF, but um, that might be a consideration. Um, there's some pretty large stewardship projects happening, long-term agreements that might be beneficial on that map where you demonstrate a good neighbor. Yep. So just um, something to think about. No, that's great. I really appreciate that. I think you're also on the next one missing a CFLR project, the Lakeview CFLR. I don't see on that map, but they did just receive an extension. Okay. And then, and then Nathan, just right off the bat, you know, the Rogue has a forest-wide master stewardship agreement with TNC, Loma Katsi, and um, Southern Oregon Forest Restoration Collaborative, and then the Fremont White. There may be others to the to the Northeast. I, I, I think Heise's partnership has one in the mall here. It just, it's neat to see those landscape initiatives with NGOs as well. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much for this. And you know, others, please, please kick in too as we're kind of looking at these and going through them. So, um, so yeah, that data. Uh, hey, Amanda, good to see you. See your hands raised. Yeah. Hey, guys. Sorry, I was late. I um, had a meeting go long. So, just for introduction, Amanda Sullivan Astor, Forest Policy Manager with Associated Oregon Loggers. 
Um, not sure what the question was earlier today that I'm sure we had to answer with our introduction, but I will spare you. Um, the other thing I just wanted to, I just wanted to flag, and maybe this doesn't matter. Um, you know, obviously these polygons on this specific um, map are large, right? They're boundary polygons. And I wanna make sure that we, such that, you know, the public watches these videos. I don't know if they do, but um, that we're, we're not overestimating or over promising, I guess, what's happening within these boundaries. So, you know, I don't know if there's any way to get more specific data and polygons on where projects are actually happening on the landscape within these or, you know, points or anything like that. But I don't want somebody to look at a map like this and say, oh, why, we're doing it all. Look at all those landscapes that we're treating. But these are, you know, disparate projects and we're trying to fill in the gaps. It's not like every acre within those polygons are going to have see treatment, right? So, you know, I, I think for our purposes, perhaps that doesn't matter as much, but I do think in the future and as it relates to the actual strategy, making sure that we're very clear if we do pr provide maps like this within the strategy, that it's very clear that, you know, obviously the, the acres within these polygons aren't fully, you know, every acre isn't being treated. So I just, I just don't want to overestimate um, or have the perception that just the areas outside of these polygons need, need work. I think that's a good point, Amanda. And I would also say that um, treatment's going to look differently depending on where you are. And so to the, to the extent that we can also indicate that, you know, whatever we do in these areas, because um, like what we're going to do on, on sage, uh, sagebrush habitat is going to be very different than what we do in Medford, right? And so just sort of a caveat that, you know, projects have yet to be developed and site-specific analysis and prescriptions will be developed and all that kind of good stuff. You know, I think that caveat is, is worth saying um, so that folks don't draw the wrong conclusions. Yeah, these are great comments and feedback. Um, additional, additional thoughts. Wanted to, Nathan, uh, Nathan yeah. can I ask you for one more thing? Sorry, I feel like I've jumped in a lot, but um, along the same lines as Amanda and SJ's lines of question, I guess one of the overarching questions I had in the beginning as you started to show maps is who are these for? Who's the audience? That would help me understand and frame, like if these are only ever going to be shown to the ASIG and the state leadership group and this stakeholder body, I'm fine, you know, maybe we don't need to <laughs> worry too much, but if they're largely going to show up in the final report, then yeah, I guess I would, I guess I, I would look at them with a slightly different eye. Yeah. 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 It's a good question. Um, so really uh, what I want to express here within these areas are kind of areas that we focus and how um, looking at the agencies, how are we all focusing in these areas and supporting you know, local landscape assessments. And I think that's a really critical piece of this is um, making sure that we support those and refine those over time with us local assessments, uh, et cetera, but areas that we really wanna focus on within the agencies. Um, and that's what we talked about too, is focusing on, you know, where where those current invest, investments are and how we can leverage those resources. So when we get into the, the funding sources, how can we understand within these maps, where do we have our funding sources, where are we putting them, et cetera. Um, and, and what is the additional funding that we need to think about in those areas? Um, so when it comes to who is the audience for it, I mean, right, you know, uh, within these conversations, kind of discussion and, and um, helping us think about where we put decisions and uh, et cetera. But I guess question two is, um, you know, we've always thought about putting them in the reports, um, but is there is there different thoughts about that, um, whether we shouldn't be putting them in the report and also you know, these give us an opportunity to really um, pinpoint stuff and look at stuff and talk about things. So, you know, request request feedback and any thoughts on this as well.
Amanda. Yeah, I, I, I'm fine with them being, you know, in an appendix or something like that, but I think that they have to include additional data, whether it's tables that show, you know, acres proposed for treatment, um, if there has been treatment, things like that. I just feel like taking them at face value without kind of contextualizing them um, is a disservice. Um, and I guess, you know, from my perspective, in AOL, um, there's there, you know, we have maps that show that there's a lot happening out there and there and there are, but there's so much more that needs to happen. And like I said, some of those large polygons, I just feel like taken at face value, they imply that we are doing what we need to do over these large landscapes, but there's a lot of work that still needs to happen. And so if you start to kind of pile on and know there's five different polygons with large fund sources and um, you know, intent for treatment all kind of stacked on top. I don't want the public to now think, oh, you know, that specific acre is good or that specific area is good. It, it just doesn't really tell that whole story. So I'm fine with them being in there as long as it's really intentional and um, contextualized with some additional kind of discrete data, either through a table or other mechanism. Yeah, yeah thank you. And Pete, I don't know if, if you have thoughts there or kind of to your kind of thoughts behind that, if you have any answers. Uh, no answers. I, I'd i have to think about it more. I mean, I think there's pros and cons. I would, I think it's important to be transparent and um, agree that if we're going to show something, we provide context and interpretation of what the map is showing. And at the same time, I, I guess part of me feels like we don't need to show every single one of these mapped products that you all have created. They're helpful for discussion and sp sparking conversation with our group, or again, with like the state leadership group or the ASIG, but it doesn't feel like, I guess a, a gut reaction, if you're asking me for an answer, like it doesn't feel like all of them are necessary. Yeah. I agree, I agree with that. Yeah, Derek? So I, I think maps are great as a visual aid, but maps are not the story itself. So I, I would be interested to see how the report comes together um, and how the, the, the maps support and illustrate the, um, the narrative that you have about, uh, about the plan, the strategy, about how we're moving forward. Um, just looking at this particular map, um, it's uh, for uninitiated viewers, um, we have so many different grant programs going on and different projects going on funded from different levels. This is the Community Wildfire Defense Grant. We have the Landscape Resiliency Projects. We've got good neighbor authority projects. We've got everything else going on. So, um, you know, having one map with every project might get a little weird. Um, and, you know, just to, um, to, to Amanda and, and Pete's points earlier, um, large polygons for boundaries, we, we need to contextualize because we don't want anyone at a glance saying, oh my gosh, is that all pre-commercial thinning? Um, you know, wh whatever that looks like. So I, I, I would be more concerned with seeing what the, um, what the narrative in the story is about the strategy and how we're moving forward and using specific visual aids to reinforce and support what that strategy is showing. Yeah. Marco? Uh, I Tied to the conversation, I, I guess it goes back to the audience. I think Pete brought that up. And just thinking about, um, you know, attrition or changing of leadership, it's always good to have a, an educational element to the, to the strategy and the document. So for each of these maps, it would probably be good to have a descriptor on what these different programs are a short descriptor somewhere, and uh, maybe to um, Derek, to your point, but I think it's important if we're going to paint this picture of shared stewardship through this 20-year strategy that, at least in the current space, these are the current programs that are addressing the uh, wildfire risk and forest resiliency issues, so it, there, there's a lot of other ones that we're probably not representing, so I just... Yeah, thinking about the audience, it, it would be good to have it maybe be a little broader as uh, information sharing for lay people 
And that's why I think these maps are great. They're not super busy right now. And for a layperson to come in and look at, um, you know, the state and what's happening, um, I, I'm impression, but we, we might want to think about the audiences, not just the insiders that know about this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan. Yeah, that's all, I think, um, really valuable feedback um, on all accounts. And I don't want to uh, rehash any of it. Uh, just a couple of additional thoughts that come to my mind, you know, thinking about um, the idea that the actual strategy itself, you know, we don't want it to be a 300 page document. I, it'd be nicer to be a 30 page document. Um, and from that perspective, you know, keeping that in mind and using to, to Derek's and others points, the right visuals to tell the story in combination with the text is I think, you know, the space we want to be in. Um, maybe there is an appendix or appendices if people really want to dig into the, into the weeds. But I also wanted to react um, to Amanda's comment about the fact that they're static. And uh, that, that is definitely um, my biggest concern. And that's where, again, just to reiterate, getting into the development of um, some decision support tools, dashboards, whatever terms we want to use to describe them, I think is going to be really valuable down the road. Pete, to your point about being able to communicate with the legislature about um, the impact of investments um, the where, the how much, et cetera, um, positioning ourselves to be able to do that um, effectively and turn things off and on depending on the question that's being asked or the story that we're uh, needing to tell is, is really the key and where we want to go. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Susan Jane? Uh, yeah, uh, I apologize too for filling up so much airspace. Um, but one other caveat that we may want to um, flag somewhere, and we talked about this last time, was that, you know, these are the initial landscapes. Um, and everybody wants to, in this case, be on the map as a, you know, important place that we're going to do work in. And so, and I saw that on one of the um, slides, you saw you had a like a, a short, um, short term priority landscapes. Um, and I would just like I would ask that we build that out slightly with one or two sentences that this is where we're going first, but don't worry, we're going to get to other places too. Um, so that um, we can generate as much support as we can for this approach in in terms of implementation moving forward. Yeah, that's great. Excellent. Thank you for all of that. That's really good. And, and part of the intent here, too, was just to also kind of show the suite of data that that we've been getting and, and the refinement and how we display this. I think it was identified a while ago as one of the biggest challenges, how to put all this together within a static map and, and definitely um, really good feedback. And I just wanted to you know, finalize running through of, of some of the other data and, and also within that decision support, how can all of this data um, put together really help us inform decisions of where we should be going in the future, making our investments, et cetera. So um, where we're placing NEPA, um, all of that. So um, wanted to follow up from feedback from last time too, we had NEPA, um, you know, the BLM and US Forest Service NEPA, um, and just kind of some refinement in the data from feedback from last month um, to looking at uh, some of this updated information. So, you know, all, all to kind of help us um, within, the, within the implementation of the strategy, understanding uh, where all this information is. Um, so there's there's this piece of it, and then running to the next one, we had uh, briefly talked about this last time, but also understanding where's the uh, mill infrastructure, um, and, and there's a lot more um, that we can refine within this, but also understanding when we're um, looking at these areas, where are the areas that have the infrastructure um, or, or infrastructure that has closed in the past, et cetera. So just throwing some of that data out here as well. Um, and then really the last aspect of it, um, we've been really working hard to with the, uh, what we're calling the collective action groups, which is those collaborative stewardship groups and uh, cross boundary partnerships. And through that work, through that qualitative capacity assessments, understanding where are all these different groups. And it's a very busy map and really hard to display, but 
you know, within Oregon Explorer, starting to look at some of this information and how we can turn this on and off and where are the active groups and where they're not and where are areas that we need to make sure that we're um, supporting those groups, et cetera. So just really throwing that out there that, um, you know, also mapping where all these, these collective action groups are doing work on the grounds. Um, and really the next piece of it is trying to understand Kind of what is that two-way dialogue of where are those projects and how does that feed into this as well? Um, where are the, the current priority areas um, that folks are looking at regionally and locally as well? So um, just wanted to run through you know all that data and all those maps and kind of refine that thinking and really good, really good feedback on it. But I want to again go ahead and pause and um, if there's any other kind of thoughts or comments behind kind of what we've seen right here and um, et cetera. So Yeah, Marco. Just one comment. Um, I, I know this, I would look at this also as a marketing tool for our federal partners at the national level. Thinking about attracting additional federal dollars, regardless of whatever programs they come through in the future. But just to show that Oregon's really forward thinking with shared stewardship, and that's another audience. Um, we want to continue to attract those big pots of federal money for that, this all lands work. So some of that audience isn't as savvy on the issues either. So just keeping that in mind. Yeah, that's great. Nathan, what's included in that, uh, the milling? Can you go back? I can't remember, is milling infrastructure? Yeah, what's include, what, so the term milling, what are, what is this data, what are the, what is this depicting for us? Yeah, um, I need to, that's a really good question, Pete, I need to dig into it a little bit more, and, and, it, and that's, I think, the refinement of, um, well, we need to look at this data where it's uh, just all of the different infrastructure for using wood products or, or creating wood products, and um, also, I know, Amanda, we had talked about this last time, too, or it needs some refinements, but um you know, if you have any thoughts on this, understanding that uh, it may not be perfect, but I'll have to dig into that a little bit more to really. Is it, is it is it safe to say, maybe Amanda, you know the answer, is it safe to say that this is, might be better characterized as more generally like processing infrastructure? Because I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to think too about like the fact that some portion of the work that needs to get done out there is not going to include saw, you know, saw logs um even for mills that are pretty efficient with using small diameter material so is this including other processing facilities is it including sort of integrated campuses that are creating a suite of products is it all on here so it so i see samanda nodding so it's not really milling infrastructure so i i also don't know all the technical details um i believe it is they are wood processing facilities um, and and quickly getting out over my skis, but I know the team here works with the University of Montana. So the, the team being John Tekarzik, um and uh, Brendan Ketzel in planning here at ODF um, have worked with folks at the University of Montana to track this. Um, and, I, and, and I know I'm getting out over my skis, but I want to say that it, it, it does come back to um, what uh, folks are reporting on their tax returns, I think, is one of the um, underlying components of this report. But we can certainly dig in and even provide a copy of the report if you're interested. It's updated regularly. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, this is definitely including secondary and tertiary markets and and processing infrastructure. So. I guess that it, it overestimates, right? Because that's the same log or the same piece of wood that's touching multiple different locations. So it it right now, this makes it look like we have a much more robust industry um, than it is otherwise the case in, in the state. So yeah, I think differentiating, differentiating that would be good. And you know, although I appreciate having the closed or inactive on here, um, perhaps because those are facilities that could be 
reinvested in or something. I'm assuming that's why they're on here. Um, I would imagine many of those red triangles no longer have equipment. They've been divested, turned into something else. So I'm not sure what the utility is in the end, having them other than just painting somewhat of a sad picture for me <laughs> that, that these mills and, and this infrastructure doesn't exist anymore. But um, we might want to think through that a little bit more and, and we can touch base offline, Nathan. And, and, you know, Kyle's not here today. I know he is on this committee, but I'm sure OFIC would be more than happy to coordinate on getting accurate information, whatever that whatever that means or however we want to display it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's another thing to point out here too with this data from 2007 to 21. I believe they're going through a survey right now to gather updated information. So have a have more of a clear picture. Um, but once again, kind of the, the need and the desire to provide more clarity around some of the information of what is it really telling us. So um, and, and yeah, Amanda, offline conversation would be great. So appreciate that. Yeah. And one other thing I'd add, I mean, I know, I know OFRI captures a lot of this data as well. And they, I believe, are looking at reinitiating um, or, or doing an update on their forestry economic kind of economic impact research that they've done in the past. So they, they would be another partner. I'll, you know, I recognize you guys have a relationship with University of Montana, but um, I think OFRI would be another uh, key resource to, to help with this. But again, we can connect more offline. Yeah, thank you. All right. Any others here? Any other kind of last thoughts, comments? Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and um, transition. Um, just wanted to give people space. And once again, offline conversations always, uh, always welcome. And um, yeah, so thank you. All right. Um, yeah, Pete. Sorry, Nathan. I just, I know we talked about this last time too, but I guess I just want to put a pin in a, a conversation thinking through the repercussions of I know timelines are what they are and June 2023 is coming up um however uh, you know think through the repercussions of producing a map uh based on at least on the wildfire risk component piece the QWRA acknowledging that the QWRA refresh is going to produce a map that is probably likely going to look significantly different than this one. Um, and I guess just be mindful of potential ripples <laughs> in the pond that that might create going forward when we, when the, I, I, for everything we do to market and communicate clearly that we're going to adaptively manage this strategy, I just worry about ruffling feathers of showing one map that at least again, to some, in some part relies pretty significantly on the QWRA only to pretty quickly have to show, you know, change that map and wondering what that will do. And it's not necessarily your problem alone to solve, but uh, again, I just putting it out there so that we don't forget it. Yeah, it's a great comment. Yeah, I was trying to decide if I was, would weigh in or not. We certainly talked about that a lot um, here, and we certainly have some sensitivity to maps, as you all can understand. Um, the timeline is uh, certainly a challenge for us in this case, and um, I don't know what the what the right answer is. Uh, we can try to provide some context around it, certainly, uh, as we discussed earlier. But uh, at the end of the day, there will be changes. Well, at the very least, let Doug Graff know what kind of a shitstorm he's going to have uh, when this map hits the um, public um, and then potentially dealing with another one coming on later on. So I think I think it's a fair point um, to at least have the narrative out there. Excellent. 
we'll, we'll tack this on to uh, Doug's list of things that the update to the QWRA will impact because he's already anticipating um, that impact to uh, the, the, the wildfire hazard map update. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, we got to look at that and we're going to go ahead and transition. Um, Dan is going to go ahead and lead us in a conversation around goals. Um, so I want to kind of jump into that next. And once again, in regards to maps, et cetera, happy to have offline conversations and just really appreciate all that feedback. So I'm kind of kind of go through this process. So uh, Dan, I'm going to pass it to you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so the next topic for us is goals, but I'm going to kind of put it that in context a bit, um, which is to sort of share first the report outline. Um, and as you can imagine, we're kind of in the, <clears throat> what a friend of mine once called the wrestling the beast um, pro uh, component of the process here. Uh, which is sort of like taking all this information and putting it into a meaningful presentation that is all uh, consistent and cohesive and gives people a sense of what we're trying to achieve. So what I want to do is lay out our, our current thinking on the report outline um, and, and then how sort of the goals and the metrics fit into that and we'll dive into the goals. So, you know, the easy part here is like you know, the introduction, the need for a new approach, um, and you know, sort of go through these you know, uncharacteristic wildfires, climate change, et cetera, and sort of what's based on in terms of 762 and all of that. Talked a lot about vision and strategic elements, and we'll present the governance structure and engagement and, and how all of that's happening. And then the next part here is around what we've currently called uh, prioritizing investments in landscape resilience. And the way of thinking about this is like, what is the crux of this? And uh, Nathan and I today were talking about the, that term investments and wondering, is that the right term? Is this the right way of framing it? But basically what we're thinking about is here, the uh, initial priority geographies and the note, the initial here, which I think addresses a lot of the concerns uh, that will be really emphasized. Uh, the priority actions, which we've talked about around treatments, capacity readiness, planning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the funding sources and programs, all the things that are going to fund all of this, and then the goals and metrics, the things that sort of point us in the right direction to doing the right amount of things in the right places at the right time to get everything done to the end. Um, so that's um, how we've been thinking about this. And then a... Uh, the next part then becomes tracking and accountability and updating uh, involving the decision support, the dashboard and, and collecting and sharing information. And then a description about implementing the strategy. So how is this really gonna work in terms of guiding resources to priority areas, coordinating across agencies and ownerships, strengthening the agency uh, and regional partnerships, uh, and then highlighting uh, some of the near-term components for implementation. And um, as the Partner Summit is something that we've talked about a little bit, we're gonna go into more detail after we talked about goals and metrics today. And then also the science and uh, resource assessment sort of support, the decision support, the dashboard, local planning and MOUs. And this of course is a simplification of the overall thing, but I wanted to give you a sense of like how we're, thinking about laying this out um, and see if there's anything that feels wrong or inappropriate or you know, guidance you'd offer before kind of diving into the goals and metrics around this. Um, so I just wanna uh, stop here for a moment and just ask you know, any reactions to this kind of outline of the document and then we can kind of go into how the goals and metrics fit into it. None. 
one way or the other. So I think you're just waiting to see what it actually reads like. Uh, Pete. I, Dan, I do have one. And it, it's a clarifying question. And because we've talked in the past about and heard from Washington DNR um, too, that, you know, there's sort of a intermediate step before we get to implementation where we know given the coarseness of the data that we're working with at the, for sort of the statewide prioritization that we we can't necessarily identify the places we would go nor what we would go do there that would be appropriate without some sort of mid-scale landscape evaluation or analysis so can you clarify where that would fit in here or is that something that we could consider adding into this process to call out clearly that we're we're not making those local decisions that 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 that's another step that would have to come along this sort of trajectory towards implementation yeah absolutely it's a great it's a great point um and the last item here on the right hand side here local planning and mous addresses that directly um but it will in, in the sense that that is one of the uh, initial things that we want to do is support local planning um, and to sort of do that intermediate step. Uh, because as you as we've described, like we're setting these big landscape areas. And when we describe these big landscape areas and these initial priorities, we're going to be noting that this is sort of um, this this is sort of the areas where we're going to be funneling money, but the uh, the work that needs to be done, the definition of the priorities within those geographies is up to the local groups and communities that are working there. Uh, and so, and the local planning and MOUs will help us get there. So I think that that's going to be well incorporated in this document. That's a really good point. Thanks. Dan, I might just jump in real quick too and say that, and I think we've discussed this um, pretty well in most uh, most of the groups that we're working with. You know, thinking about what are the primary areas where where we want to invest, and that's in implementation, planning, and capacity. Um, and I and I think that will come out in this um, text as well. Um, and that to me, so I think you raise a really great point. Um, about kind of that intermediate step and that being that is something that is driven locally, but as we're looking at um, prioritizing investments, we also have to think about what kind of investments are we making. Um, and so it's not always about cutting cutting something it's about doing the planning or even building the local community capacity to have that locally led effort to get to the point of of planning and implementation. Um, and, and, and so I, I kind of think of those three buckets of investment as being central to the strategy, if, that, if that's helpful. Yeah, the way we've written it so far, the priority actions, which is on the left-hand side of the bottom there, second bullet down, um, is sort of, you know, it highlights the sort of treatment actions of mechanical um, controlled fire and, you know, even wildfire, right, um, and then maintenance. Um, but then it also goes into detail about the supporting things that you need in in place, the condition, getting the conditions in place to make those actions happen, which is the capacity readiness, even the milling infrastructure, um, the workforce, uh, all of that kind of stuff we need to start thinking about. So yeah, I think exactly. Uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be hitting on that in multiple ways. Martin. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, just a comment. Where Dan, where where are the tribes in this outline? Where would they be couched? And uh, it seems like that should be pulled out as its own unique G2G relationship somewhere in there. Yeah, they will be um, uh, addressed, I suppose, if that's the correct term, um, in the governance and engagement section, which I didn't go into much detail about, okay. but um, they will definitely, they a, a very important section there. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Got it. Can I was just going to, yeah, I was just, Dan, thanks. I was just going to acknowledge, thanks. Appreciate the um, additional dialogue and stuff for that local planning piece um, and recognition that there's going to need to be resources out there. I think the one problem that we typically face in any given legislative session is we get a bunch of planning stuff dumped on us in terms of, a, and have zero resources to draw on. Um, so I think that's going to be really helpful. I think, again, keeping that message going forward with this piece. 
Yeah, that's a good point as well. It used to be called unfunded mandates, right? Um, and probably still are. Um, and uh, my hope, I, this is something more for ODF, for you know, Nathan Ryan and others to sort of talk about is sort of you know, the importance of the resources to support this. And you know, this is why we've identified the uh, funding mechanisms and also to recognize where there are limitations or gaps or inadequacies in those existing uh, funding mechanisms that need to be filled to do this work. Because um, I think that's critical. I, I think that's critical, but that's, you know, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I'll jump in again and say, you know, overall, the intent of this is, is to support the good work that's happening at the ground level. Um, and in some of the other conversations I know I've sat in on, and, and what I know is personally important to me is that really through the shared stewardship governance model, uh, we create an opportunity to um, be able to identify things that are working well and, and re you know, reinforce and invest in those, and also identify things that aren't working well and be able to raise those up and get them to the appropriate level of leadership um, and whatever agency or organization can help us to, um, you know, find a way through to solve those issues to help work move forward locally. And, and my work in this space and, and talking with others, I think that's the one thing that we kind of miss and that we're missing in Oregon um, is, is a mechanism to um, be able to have those conversations and identify and, and address some of those roadblocks. Yeah, and going back to that um, an earlier question about policy change, um, you know, this is an area where like we're not in a position to sort of lay out um, specific policy recommendation changes, you know, policy changes or recommendations of policy changes, but we can perhaps um, point to some of the areas where um, those kinds of things would be beneficial and then to work on them over the course of the next you know, year or so, so we're ready for the next session or the one after that. Any other comments, observations? Yeah. And let me move on to, so, the idea here is that uh, you know, in pr prioritizing investments, we identify the geographies, we identify the actions and the sources, and then the, the goals and metrics are essentially like, how much do we need to be doing by when? Um, and so um, what we've talked about here is you've seen this before, but um, thinking now as we get more specific um, about the criteria for the goals and the way we've been thinking about this is really quite high level because we don't want to sort of dictate too much. We want to point in the right direction, but not be too too um, uh, micro uh, managing on it. Um, we also want the the criteria and the metrics to be efficient to measure. We don't want to be able. We don't want to be creating things that are going to create a lot of difficulty. Likelihood is if we um, try to create sort of complex things to measure, it's just not gonna happen. So we really want it to be efficient in terms of low cost, easy, accessible um, data. Um, and then the other thing is we've talked about not too many. Um, and uh, the idea being that we've got way too many goals, then it's gonna be, you know, we're not gonna track them all, then it's gonna become a problem. And then the other thing that has come up is like, there are outcome goals, there's process, and there's actions. We need to sort of think about all those, those activities, all those components of it. So that's how we've been thinking about it. And you'll see what that means here in a moment. So you've seen this before, the, um, you know, the governance, the capacity of funding and tracking um, as being a kind of, you know, sort of some of the process oriented things and then the landscape conditions that cast rock wildfires being the kind of outcome things that we're really track, trying to achieve. And then we've shown you this set of strategic elements that we had some intention of creating goals around it. We've actually 
held very productive conversations with um, specialists in each of these topic areas um, and have had really great discussions around here, around these topics. And we initially thought that we would create um, uh, specific goals around those topics. We're, we're kind of leaning away from that now because there's so, it adds so many goals. They're sometimes very difficult to measure and track. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of the sort of guidance we've gotten from the specialists is not so much to create um, measurable goals, but more to sort of try to try to head in that direct direction and be sure that we're coordinating and cooperating and supporting those goals as we're doing other work. And so we're starting to think about looking at those strategic elements, um, not so much as a part of goals, but more just as a part of what we're trying to achieve. So we can come back to that as well. Um, so the other piece of this as we dive into this a little bit is the recognition that um, so, a lot of these goals are dependent on the acreages that need work. Um, and we don't yet have a good uh, calculation of that. And so you'll see that, you know, we still have X million. So we're not done with the million acre, with the number of acres kinds of things uh, if we go with that. Um, so anyway, uh, we're still in the middle of the process of putting this all together. All of that caveat to say, here's you know, what we're thinking about in terms of uh, some of the goals. So landscape condition, we've seen this before, um, per, perhaps 100% of Oregon's landscapes in a resilient condition by 2043, recognizing that we still have to define what resilient condition means. And that's something we're gonna ask the SARA group to do, the science and resource assessment group to actually define that so we can then have uh, a way of measuring it. Um, and then you know, sort of effectively treated in some ways, that's um, not yet fully defined as well, but you know, the Governor's Wildfire Council and some of the others have sort of identified like 40% um, or something of that nature. So we're still working towards that as well. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you each of these and feel free to um, raise your hand or sort of just, if I don't stop and um, shout because I can't actually see you uh, in most cases. Um, and uh, then I'll show all of them together and we can look at them as a totality. Um, so we've had this conversation about uh, wildfire. We used to have, I used to call it, um, uh, what do we call it? Uh, catastrophic wildfire and switched the name to uncharacteristic wildfire because one of, some of the comments were that, uh, you know, wildfire is not always bad and even severe wildfire can have benefits. And, um, and so we started thinking about it in a different way of uncharacteristic wildfires. Um, that too has yet to be defined, I think. And so, or not that I'm aware of. So anyway, um, but maybe we'd want to measure the, you know, the number and the size of uncharacteristic wildfires and the number of structures burned with the idea that we are reducing that over time. And so, Again, this is an example of how we're thinking about that topic. The governance and engagement has been really challenging. Um, and uh, just to sort of put a real mm, quantifiable uh, goal around. So we're still, to be honest, working on that. We can uh, talk about that. I'd love more sort of suggestions on that. Uh, capacity and readiness, the way we've thought about this, is thinking about what capacity and readiness leads to. So not sort of measuring capacity and readiness necessarily itself, but some of the sort of outcomes that would um, be important. So, you know, treatments can be implemented in 100% of the priority geographies because we're, we've got the capacity and readiness to do so. Um, the landscape assessments are initiated in all the priority geographies. That's sort of a specific component of that capacity and readiness, NEPA as well. So, um, this is, uh, you know, again, what we thought about for this. With funding, um, this is also like a, a little bit squirrely. Um, and, you know, we thought about sort of the alignment of funding needs and funding availability. So one possible way of framing the goal is resources from state, federal, and private sources are commensurate with needs to achieve a 10 pace and scale of 
uh, retreatments, capacity, and readiness. So thinking about all the various components we need to invest in and making sure we've got the resources to do so. Um, and you can sort of imagine like, you know, here's what we need and here's what we've got. And so um, as a way of kind of measuring that. Um, tracking and accountability. Uh, the way we thought about this is the number of agencies contributing information, completeness of the data, and sort of the ability of the public to actually see it. And so um, what we've got here is example goals, all partner agencies contributing, um, annual contributing relevant financial activity and landscape uh, data um, you know, by 2025, and then a, a, a dashboard that is, is set up and available and you know, continually updated. So here's all of them together. And I put this together as a way of sort of helping us and sort of consider the question, if we were to do all of these things, would we achieve our goal? Is this, is, does, does this help put us in the right direction? Um, do all, you know, together, is this the right set um, of things? Is there anything that's like uh, missing? Is there something that doesn't need to be there? Um, is this helpful? Etc. So this is where I want to really open up the conversation and get your all's uh, perspective on it. Recognizing that you know, these are still in, they're still uh, uh, in process, let's say. So none of these are finalized, but this is sort of the direction we're heading. John. Uh, yeah, I think this is a real good start. Uh, try and uh, visualize how this applies to rangeland. Uh, rangeland's got a little bit of a difference compared to the to the forested areas. I know I'm oversimplifying it, but I expect in the forested areas, if you get the litter and the biomass down to a certain level you're approaching resilience but in the rangeland this stuff that already has the invasive annual grasses you've uh, you've got to treat that and uh, some places will require seeding some hopefully will just require a release in the bunch grasses to to reoccupy but you do your project and then you've got to uh have it followed by the right spring where you've got the right growth conditions and, and then you have a progress with your your native bunch grasses and, and you move in the right direction but that's weather related and tricky and uh I think progress is going to be pretty slow and uh, I think we'll get better at it over time and there'll be a time when we'll be at steady progress. But I think the state of the technology now we're almost in a, in a state of technology where holding the line on invasive annuals is probably a, a goal and not talking about uh, a high percentage of being in resilient condition. So I think rangelands will have to have that kind of a thought process, at least near term. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I, um, I'm thinking, you know, landscapes in a resilient condition, um, if we define resilience, healthy and resilient, health and resilience of, of, a, of landscapes you know, sort of uniquely for each um, uh, ecosystem type, uh, at least broadly, um, that potentially could address it. But I also, you know, as I think about it, um, the, the challenge of the invasives is is uh, uh, is challenging um, and and slow work. Um, so it. it there's you know, another piece of this is like setting ourselves up for success. Like we want to sort of 
point ourselves in the right direction and create um, uh, goals that sort of are you know, sort of old and, and, and uh, intentional, but at the same time, at the end of the day, we don't want to set ourselves up for something that is just impossible to achieve. So we may need to think about this a bit. Um, and uh, I, I'm curious, I, I see Susan, Jane, and, and, uh, and, and Katie, is there anybody who wants to weigh in on that topic before we move on to others? Yes. Um, if, sorry, Susan, Jane, I'll, I'll be fast. Um, I think John brings up an, an important point. So the temporal dimensions of treating fire risk and rangeland is quite different, right? We're talking about it's largely a fine fuels driven system. So we're not talking about ladder fuels or, or heavy fuels. We're actually really talking about grass. Um, and, and what that means is treat thoughts about treatments need to take place in nearly real time, right? And so we have great products, which I, I think maybe Megan has introduced um, here, like the range and analysis platforms, fire probability maps, right? You're nodding, Dan, so I think you've seen those. Um, and I'm not saying it has to be that, but like we have tools that tell us, you know, the variability Spatially, in terms of fire risk, is so different on rangelands and forest lands. And so, what I'm wondering is maybe a goal is thinking about a process for nimbly deploying treatments within project areas. And so, I'm looking at maybe the governance and engagement section, Dan, where we talk about how people in an area will work together to respond in a timely fashion to these. Um, emergent fuel conditions that are characteristic of rangelands rather than a, a little more of a stagnant decision process that will take place over 15 years. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I, th I think we're going to need to uh, work with the rangeland experts to kind of think about how to frame that well. At least, they, at least I would because I don't have the sort of knowledge of that uh, those systems well enough in my mind to kind of be intelligent at this moment. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Susan Jay? Yeah, so a couple of thoughts. Um, one about landscape condition, um, which also um, dovetails with capacity and readiness. Um, I, I would like to see with the landscape condition um, maybe adjusting that near-term goal. Um, I don't know what the acre number is. I don't know what that right answer is, but um, at the end there you have and increasing as appropriate. And I would like to be a little bit more definitive if we can, because again, we've got these priority landscapes that we're gonna hit first in the first five years, but I would like to really have us um, onboarding new geographies um, at a, at a pretty rapid clip, um, you know, the extent of the need is great. We do need to increase the pace, scale, and quality of this work. And I think the only way we're going to do that is if we actually set out specific goals for ourselves that get us there. So rather than saying and increasing as appropriate, I might say something like adding two new landscapes per year after year five or something like that, where we're, we're onboarding new landscapes. And I understand all of the limitations around funding and, and capacity availability and all that kind of good stuff. So I, I don't mean for that goal to kind of trump reality in terms of money. <laughs> if we don't have money out there, we're not gonna do this. Um, but I think having that kind of um, demonstrated uh, increase in pace and scale and quality is is appropriate because that's what I think we all support here. And so if we can write that into our landscape condition, um, I think that would be awesome. And that may be um, that the landscape condition may also be a piece where we could put in a particular goal around rangelands. Um, I don't know if that's appropriate, but that might be a place to put it so that we kind of do identify that forested landscapes are a little different than our rangeland uh, landscapes. And we just need to recognize that difference. And therefore also 
the the pace of um, restoration. So I would suggest that. Um, and then in governance and engagement, um, you know, I like the bullet around cross boundary projects. What I would also like to see, and thinking back to um, how what we were talking about before in terms of how implementation of the twenty year plan might show up, um, and doing that in the context of shared stewardship, um, I would like to add a metric that uh, is something around um, new partnerships that are developed. So whether that's and, and however you want to define partnership or whatever, but I think you know what I'm getting at is basically we want more um, more dialogue with land managers, state federal land managers, and stakeholders. And so let's you know actually hold ourselves accountable by requiring the development um, of new relationships. And and I again like the last point, I recognize that you can't force people to be your friends and you can't force them to be at the table. But if it's a goal for ourselves um, to develop new relationships that will help us meet the goals of the 20 year plan, I think we've got to put it in there as a metric. So I'd like to see that added to in, in some way. Excellent, thank you. Katie? Yeah, well, I'm really pleased to follow Susan Jane because um, she kind of hit on something I wanted to raise. So first of all, I recognize that you haven't yet defined resilience, but a dimension of that, especially when we're talking about fire adapted communities, is um, you're not just creating resilience, right? It's not an end state. It's an ongoing effort. And so Susan Jane hit on it, the creation of new um, organizational or social structures that support this in the long term. And so I think a, a really important goal would be um, what Susan Jane described and whether that's formal organizations or um, like a transformation in, in knowledge and participation surrounding um, projects for resilience, I think might be important so that this is enduring over time rather than just treatments are completed um, in 15 years. Yeah, thank you. Um, Pete? Uh, yeah, well, I, I guess before I share the comment and was planning to share, I'll just say plus one on that. I, I And I, I was listening, I don't remember when it was, time's going too fast for me right now, but some presentation on social adaptive capacity as a means for tracking you know, our ability to live in and around these landscapes where fire is inevitably going to visit us. And there's, I, I saw some interesting papers in this presentation about social adaptive capacity. And I wonder if there's something there in this that, you know, because some of the, I feel like some of what they were talking about hits on that. But again, that, not the point I was going to make. I, I just, I guess I wanted to think about the uncharacteristic wildfire um, element and I guess I understand the intention there, and I, I, but I, I might suggest that it, it might be difficult <laughs> to, to measure this one. I mean, yeah, I'm trying to think of an example on the fly, but you know, what counts as an uncharacteristic wildfire, um, especially when we know there are instances, many instances where there are significant portions of fire that are low intensity, even on extreme wildfires, low intensity mixed or moderate intensity and high intensity wildfire. And so at what threshold does it, the whole fire, if you're only gonna count the number of fires or the size of those, at what point does it does it transition into uncharacteristic wildfire? Um, and so thinking back to how we're actually defining um, the priority or, or analyzing the priority areas and some of the input data there, I wonder if, um, I wonder if an alternative for this one could be to look at trends in the reduction of risk to values that are relevant to the landscape. Um, and that could be defined at the local level by those partnerships or collaborative groups. Um, could be defined statewide too, if we can, I, you know, there, there are those HVRAs or highly valued resources and assets within the QWRA. And as they go through the process of refreshing on the periodic basis, the QWRA I, I mean, I think that would be a relevant place for us to look for a metric um, to assess 
how effectively we are actually reducing, in this case, maybe the, the negative effects of wildfire, but also then able to tra uh, look at how the landscape changes in terms of where wildfire actually might be, do might, um, be likely to do positive work on the landscape. That's a really helpful uh, thought, Pete. And, and um, Amanda, I'll get you next, um, but I would sort of also really welcome other people's thoughts on that. Um, Amanda, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And I transitioned to the car, so sorry if I am slow on mute or hand raise or any of those functions at this point. Um, but I, uh, I'll, I'll first kind of touch on what. Um, Pete just brought up because I, I had a, a similar thought. Um, you know, I, we need to think about what we can actually measure and how we measure that. And although I understand what we're trying to get at with the uncharacteristic, I think, yeah, it's, it's currently undefined. I think it's going to be really tough to get to some sort of consensus on how we would define that and how we would measure that and what is that threshold. Um, you know, I think that there are more simple things that we can measure that then can get, co you know, collated into a more substantive conversation and kind of contextualize thinking about, you know, fire severity and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I like I like the idea that that Pete had related to the um, HBRAs and thinking through uh, effect of fire on those um those values and assets. So that, that I think that would be a really delicate solution there. Um, I don't, yeah, I guess, I guess calling it uncharacteristic, you know, the, just the, the term that we're used that we're, you know, like I changed to from the catastrophic to uncharacteristic. I, I don't mind that as much as just what the actual metric is that goes along with it. So just want to put that on the record. And then um, secondly, to the, the conversation around uh, that Susan Jane brought up and, and others dittoed related to uh, maybe metrics around partnerships. I, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that. And I think that we should be coordinating more and, and having, um, you know, more coordinated efforts. I think that's what a lot of this is for. Um, but I don't want to that to get interpreted into, um, you know, just any amount of more process and more talking is good. Um, so I think we need to be really careful about that. Um, but, you know, I, so I guess we just need to be careful at what, what that is, because at the end of the day, the folks that I represent are the ones doing the work on the ground. And a lot of times they can't go to collaborative meetings because they run production businesses. And a day that they are sitting talking about something is the day wasted that they aren't getting work done in the woods. And I, argue that getting work done in the woods is more important than talking about getting work done in the woods. So um, I, I just want to put that on the record. I'm not, you know, totally um, saying that I would, would go against that, uh, that recommendation. I just think that we need to be careful on how and why we're measuring it and being really clear about that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Amanda. I appreciate all of that. Um, it's making me think about um, sort, of, <laughs> sort of what now seems almost obvious maybe is, um, you know, we set these priority areas based on QWA values and landscape health values that uh, we have data for, and we're going to continually update that information. And maybe that's just a an easy way to determine how we make in progress if those values are declining. Um, so we'll have to look into that a little bit more. I'm happy for like other reactions on that idea. Um, uh, John? Uh, yeah, I've just got a, a few reactions to to what I'm hearing. When we looked at the at the map as to what where the groups were collaborative groups were active, there was a lot of color on that map. There was not much of that map that wasn't colored. I, I'm not sure if we need new groups or if we just need to expect products from the groups that are out there. Uh, I'm not sure if a metric uh, forming new groups is uh, the one we want. Uh, 
my my other thoughts uh i i think acres burned as we go forward it'll get a little bit problematic because if we get in the mode of uh getting this landscape in shape where there's a a little more opportunity to allow wildfires to achieve goals will will have acres to tease out to compare apples to apples but i i still think the especially for the general public the acres burned per year is the barometer that tells them how this wildfire thing is a uh, kind of grown and got out of hand and as we're successful going forward i think it'll be a good indicator of how successful we are so i i think that's going to be important to track there there may be other things as pete describes that'll be useful as well but i i think that acres burned and the semantics of uncharacteristic wildfire and catastrophic wildfire i I don't think it's going to be that big of a problem, but I, I still think acres are going to be uh, important to track. Thanks. Yeah, and I appreciate that, John. I, I, what I'm thinking as you're talking is there may be uh, distinctions between what we track, for example, acres burned, um, and what we set as goals, uh, in part because the goals are intended to sort of uh, help us be sure we're making progress in the right directions. And sometimes acres burned is, is a good thing for some sort of ecological purposes. So we've talked previously about how um, we don't wanna create, send messages that suggest fire is bad all the time. And that's what we're trying to kind of like thread, I guess. Um, but we also, I think you make a good point that we wanna track that as well, even if we don't set goals for it. I don't, I'm just sort of offering thoughts here. Um, we'll have to sort of take all this in, input and kind of work with it together. So, uh, but thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, any other comments on this? All right. Well, I just want to say thank you. This is really helpful. Um, gave us. Um, a lot of help. I mean, we ought to be honest, like, this is probably the, the piece that we're kind of struggling with most to, to kind of get right. Um, and we'll probably go through a number of iterations as we go forward on this. So we'll probably be coming back to you again for, you know, sort of um, thoughts on what we come up with next, um, thinking that it may not be, you know, final even then. Um, so what I want to do now, um, and you know, I'm just noticing there's some chats here. Did I miss anything? All right. What I want to do now is move on to the uh, Partner Summit um, that we mentioned. And this is sort of, you know, the context here is, okay, we've, we've produced the strategy. Uh, we've got this document. Um, all of the agencies ideally are bought into it. They're supportive of it. They've endorsed it. Um, maybe we've already released it. Maybe we have it. Um, and the question then becomes, how do we jumpstart the implementation process with all the various people uh, involved? And so the idea here is to bring all these partners together uh, to kickstart implementation of this strategy. And some of the things that we'd like to do if, at this uh, summit are demonstrate agency capacity, sorry, agency commitment, um, and, and sort of create an understanding of how all the pieces fit together, the priority areas, the funding, the accountability, um, et cetera, et cetera, that we've just been talking about. Um, and then, you know, identify and address concerns, barriers, um, especially among the regional groups who have, who, who have been at this point uh, less engaged in it, although we're starting to really engage with them. Um, but, you know, they're the ones who are going to be largely responsible for implementing this. And we really want to create those uh, partnerships across uh, 
the, the agencies. Um, the tribes as well, we would like to, I, I don't know how to th really think about the tribes in this because they are in many ways a kind of, they deserve a special place and I don't really know how to sort of in, engage them in this and, and also sort of respect that special place yet. So we have some work to do to think about that. Um, and then um, developing next steps for moving all of these components forward. So that's the kind of the hope for this event. Um, and when it would happen, probably late September or sometime in the month of October, um, you know, ideally after the height of fire season, recognizing the fire season goes on and on sometimes. And one of the big questions that we, we want to think about here is like one day or multiple days. And there's we've talked about this a little bit previously. Uh, some people have suggested a multi-day thing, but that also creates probably some barriers to attendance. Um, and so there's sort of trade-offs there. Um, and then where should we think about doing this? And places that we've thought about so far as Portland, because a lot of people live there or near uh, Salem, that's the seat of government, um, a central location like Bend or another location that's really easy for all the various attendees to access because we're going to be drawing from them all around the state. So these are things that I'm hoping we can discuss. And then, you know, I think an important piece is who would be attending? And so um, we're thinking sort of in the range of maybe 80 to 150, which is, you know, quite a large range, but uh, you start thinking about the SLG members, perhaps governor's office staff, tribes, maybe legislators could be invited, the ASIC members, um, you all, uh, you know, regional groups and, and, uh, and partners, uh, interested local government staff in the cities and counties, et cetera, tribal agency, tribal liaisons, all the folks involved in SARA and uh, decision support work, uh, NGO researchers, et cetera. And then agency staff who have uh, thus far been you know, somewhat involved, but not um, not fully involved. Um, and uh, especially those who are like in regional staff or program leads who are gonna be affected by this uh, or have to be involved in it, but haven't yet been thoroughly involved. So you sort of think about all those folks. That's the kind of um, uh, gathering that we're currently thinking about. And then thinking about a proposed agenda um, and this, you know, we just put this together yesterday, so you're the first to really see this, but, um, you know, maybe having sort of a, you know, opening remarks or keynote from a high level federal person or the governor, like you can imagine, like if it's going to be a really bad fire season, maybe the governor would want to say something, um, maybe somebody like, you know, Wyden or, um, um, or Merkley, or maybe an SLG member can, or, you, or even like Senator Golden or something like that is a kind of uh, keynote person. And then, um, you know, providing an overview of the strategy and then kind of a, an SLG roundtable, basically the SLG, you know, agency leaders basically demonstrating their commitment to this um, and, you know, what they're willing to kind of commit in terms of uh, resources and support. And then, and I imagine that would sort of be like, if we did this in a single day, that could be sort of the morning session. Uh, and then perhaps, and this is less well formed, but some, either some topic breakouts or some group oriented breakouts or both um, that uh, allow for groups to come together and sort of um, connect um, across, uh, across topics or across groups and sort of do peer-to-peer -peer learning and, and um, sort of set ourselves up for working together in the future uh, um, on this. This is not intended to kind of satisfy all the needs uh, and accomplish everything all at once. It's really intended to uh, get us to the starting line and hit this, you know, shoot the starting gun and get people starting to run. And so identify what needs to be done um, and how they can work together to do it and for us to learn about what we need to do to support all of those efforts. 
So that's the, the big picture. Um, and now, uh, because we're starting to think about, you know, planning this, wanted to share it with you all, get any reactions, ideas, suggestions for, uh, for making this work. Or changing it completely for that one. Marco. Uh, I'm not seeing the slide where it was uh, attendees, but um, are we leaving industry and kind of the workforce community out of uh, who would attend? If you go back several slides. Right, there you go. You have, uh, um, not intentionally. Um, and, right. And, uh, but um, you're absolutely right that um, I don't see those sort of directly. I mean, I sort of thought of those as the statewide stakeholders, but I think you're right that that needs to be more specifically identified. Thank you. Okay. Katie? I apologize if you said this. Could you um, review exactly, maybe in one sentence, what the purpose of this summit is? So this slide here kind of gives a, a summary of that, bringing the people together to kickstart implementation is sort of the one sentence, but like the idea of demonstrating agency commitment, developing an understanding of the strategy and how it all, all the pieces fit together, addressing and sort of identifying concerns and barriers, and then um, kind of getting all these folks to start thinking about next steps. Yeah, so one thought like that, um, given that objective or purpose, um, that's a pretty different group of people than, say, um, kind of the industry or local representative. You know what I mean? These are almost kind of mid, like regional representatives, right, who have an ear to the ground, but also understand how all these pieces fit in this statewide um, scheme. Am I misunderstanding that, Dan? Um, are you are you referring to the to the, the private industry folks? Um, in not not explicitly. I'm just um, that was a list of really broad attendees, and I'm thinking about everyone wants to feel like they're there for a reason that makes sense for them, and so either ch um, aligning this purpose with that attendee list or refine revising that attendee list with this purpose. I I see those not quite matching. I guess might be my comment here. Okay. Yeah, something to think about, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Amanda? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, kind of following along on the, the purpose conversation, I guess I'm wondering if the intent is to bring some of those, you know, larger thought and change leaders into the conversation to get buy-in um, and kind of leader's intent and things like that, should we wait until we have at least one of the landscape assessments created to show them what this actually looks like um, and get them rallied around that? Because I, I just don't, I don't know, bringing them in at the, you know, kind of the midway point between when we have the strategy developed, but we don't have, you know, any sort of on the ground thing to show them to rally around or for them to point to. I just am worried that it might be too premature. So I, I don't know. I don't know if you can respond to that or Nathan or Ryan, but I'm just wondering if we should have a legitimate example to point at. I'm curious, do we have, I, it seems like we have some examples of landscape assessments that have been done by local groups. If, I, if I'm understanding your question or suggestion here, um, though I, I also, I'm not sure that that's the crux of, of this. It's, it's, I think it's at, at a bigger scale at the moment, but, um, you know, I, I think at the 
at the end of the day, we want to be sure that the attendees, as you know, um, sort of feel like there's a good reason for them to be here. So that there needs to be a, uh, a connection between their world and what we're talking about. Dan, I might just have a follow up just really quick. Yeah, go for it. Um, just, I guess one of the things that I'm thinking about is when the Forest Service came out with the 10 year wildfire crisis strategy that also it also came out with a list of initial projects um, and locations where that strategy was going to be implemented. So it wasn't just one standalone high level strategy. Oh, let's talk about all the good things that could happen. But hey, these are the actual things that we're doing to achieve those goals. So I guess that's what I'm thinking that it, that strategy and the way that the Forest Service um, rolled that out, I thought was really useful, especially as a practitioner um, to be able to get behind that strategy as a whole, because it allowed me to understand how it was going to be utilized on the ground and not all the details, right? We didn't have all the details, um, but but it provided a little bit more substantive information to get behind and like, okay, I can actually believe in this because I can see how it's going to be applied on the ground. Right. Now I'm understanding your comment, Amanda. Thank you. Um, and uh, what, I, what I'm hearing here is like, we need something that's tangible, not just the, um, uh, the priority geographies and priority actions, but also like how it's going to be implemented. You know, what, what what the agencies are actually going to do and, and intersect with the local groups who are going to be doing it um, to give it a little bit more um, uh, tangibility, I guess, for for them. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I just want to make sure that we don't get into a place where we have premature celebration of successes that we haven't quite figured out yet. <laughs> That's a fair point too. Yes, thank you, Carl. Yeah, I uh, I appreciate that, Amanda. And I was saying the same thing. And and one way around that is maybe uh, this is the initial summit that it becomes an annual summit where then you can show movement over time. But you want to kickstart this and and what you have right now and educate people on what is moving forward and maybe showcase some examples. But um, maybe part of the purpose is to kind of kick off an annual summit if that's what your guys is thinking or intent is. I can certainly imagine an annual event like this that brings people together, that becomes a kind of learning peer-to-peer uh, -peer sort of you know, changes that need to be made to make it possible to do the work on the ground that needs to get done, um, surfacing issues, whatever. Um, yeah, so, and, you know, I'll note that I've heard, I don't know anything about, but I've heard that Sustainable Northwest used to do something similar like to this um, uh, that it, and that it's no longer doing so. And so maybe there's some learning here that we could do around, you know, sort of from their experience. I'll jump in real quick. So this is the first time, obviously, we've talked about this internally about the concept of a summit in the fall. Um, this is the first time I've seen some real um, text and ideas around what it might look like. And um, Carl, I think you nailed it in terms of kind of the intent and um, how this is a starting point. Um, the other thought that I'd share with folks, I'm listening to the really great feedback, is I think that one of the challenges is thinking about how do we um, there's kind of two audiences here. There's the agency audience, which is kind of the integral component of the, that shared stewardship piece. But then there's all the folks who are actually making the work happen in one way or another. Um, and how do we create the right space to bring those two groups together to talk about all the investment that we've collectively made in, in developing governance and really standing up functional shared stewardship and at the same time um, sort of if you will unveiling um, the strategic plan that really speaks to the the folks who are actually doing the work i think that's the that's the challenge that we got to figure out how to how to kind of connect those two groups at a meeting like this at least that's what i'm hearing yeah good Jared? Yeah, I'd 
I'd also just flag that um, if it's uh, multiple partners um, from around the state, 80 to 150 participants, there is a lot of uh, logistics planning and, um, and detail that has to go into that. And it'll take um, four months or longer uh, ahead of time just for the um, you know, facility planning and, and that sort of thing. So uh, look forward to more as plans come together and I'm happy to participate in the, um, in the planning process to make it all come together. Thanks. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Yeah. And you know, we've been sort of batting this idea around a little bit. And you know, I put I put this this text together yesterday. So you're the first people to see it. So Ryan, sorry that you didn't get a, a preview. Um, but you know, it it's all for the purpose of getting the input and and making it better and sort of course correcting, et cetera, early on. So um one thing I would ask if there's no other sort of comments, questions, is like, is there any sort of Suggestion towards you know one day or more you know, you know the the timing of it and the location of it, um, given your knowledge of some you know some of the attendees, especially sort of the regional folks, um, what would what would make it most likely to be attendable? Derek. Yeah, I, I can't speak to um, these particular partners. I would just think that there would need to be real good discussion around who are the invitees, the difference between agency and uh, and um, <laughs> stakeholders and, and local folks, um, where it would need to be. If it's longer than one day, do you have um, kind of activities for one day attendance for some that may have to travel farther and may not have as, as much planning and, and logistical support um, to be able to have overnight travel um, that, that again then for 80 to 150 people becomes a, a large facilities issue. Um, and, and so really just as long as you have thinking around that, I think that's great. Um, I'll defer to others on um, thoughts and um, Considerations that each of the individual groups might bring or might have when it comes to whether uh, they have the ability to attend for longer than one day or not. Thanks, Eric. Marco, and then Amanda. Yep. Yeah, Dan, I'm actually uh, supporting my staff in uh, organizing a summit right now. It'll happen in November, and it's been in planning for about a year. But we, we did settle on. Um, you know, Sun River, so, you know, in, in the central Cascades. So just thinking about locations and travel, that's a pretty good central locale in the Deschutes. And then, um, I mean, our summit's focused on an intertribal summit. And, you know, we're having to accommodate the nine tribes of Oregon, but also um, neighboring tribes whose geographies border other states. And then agency partners and other NGOs. So just in, to um, Derek's point, it, it is an immense amount of lead time. And um, I hope you guys have a good budget for that <laughs> and a coordinator. So just a few thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm also organizing a national uh, conference that's happening next week. And so I'm familiar with the logistical um, challenges and experiences. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. And I'm, I'm kind of new at this, but I'm supporting my team from the sidelines and it's a lot of work. So you got a national one. So <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Uh, Amanda? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I have so many <laughs> comments on this agenda item. Um, and I don't, I don't have the uh, agenda in front of me, so I, I want to be conscientious of time if we need to move off this topic. But um, I guess with all the conversation that we've had thus far and trying to really clarify the, the purpose and intent and the different audiences that might be there, um, one way we could think about this is like a, a two-day summit that annually then turns into a one-day summit. And so what I'm thinking is maybe the first day or half a day or something like that, or maybe there's a banquet associated with the unveiling of the strategy. And that's where all the political leaders are invited um, and people can celebrate the good work that's been done. Um, but yet other agency folks and partners would be 
invited to be there um, to, to learn about the, the plan, um, you know, the high level plan. But then the second day could be where we start to get to work on strategy related to uh, the, the landscape assessments and getting the right people into breakout rooms for the right geography is um, thinking about NEPA planning, thinking about uh, you know collaborative engagement, thinking about tribal engagement, workforce, milling infrastructure. Um, you know maybe it's broken out by by geography uh, or, or you know or something else. Um, but but maybe that's how we think about this first one in that it would be unique in nature with the unveiling of the plan in addition to a more technical summit um, to start thinking through how we actually implement it. So anyways, I'm just rattling around different ideas. So you're getting my uh, <laughs> my thoughts as they are formulated in my brain. <laughs> Always appreciated that. And, and yeah, I mean, those, are, those are great ideas there. And, um, yeah, definitely we can, we can look into that. That might actually work out very, very well. Um, so we've got about five minutes before we wrap up. Any last comments before I turn it over to Nathan? All right, well then um, let me stop sharing. And Nathan, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Yeah, appreciate the fruitful comments um, and all the thought behind it as always, right? Taking this information, refining it, kind of putting it into the the next steps, et cetera. And just kind of a few reminders, um, you know, we'll throw the PowerPoint slides and the video recording on the web page. We try to have that in a week. So uh, folks can always look back on that if, if interested. And then once again, um, you know, just uh, always offline conversations. We meet once a month, but, um, you know, always happy to have conversations in between. So we're going to keep, uh, keep driving this thing and keep working on it um, and digging into it. So um, you know, your feedback is just uh, really important to us. So we, we thank you for that. So um, great, great comments in the chat. We've got a lot of good information. I'm going to go ahead uh, and close this out. Before we do, just a reminder, um, I may not be present at the next meeting, but we got a good support team that will we'll keep everyone going. So um, just really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, with that, um, any, any last questions, comments, or thoughts before I close this out a few minutes early and um, just wrap up for the day. I'll just leave a little space. Ryan? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and, and, and echo your comments. I really appreciate it. I know this has been a big time commitment for everybody here, and I certainly haven't joined every meeting, um, but when I have dialed in, um, just I, a lot of uh, thought has gone into the comments that you make. It's clear that you're all engaged, um, and it's been really helpful. And I hope you're seeing also the results of that feedback um, as this product has developed over the last uh, six to eight months. Um, and, and just look forward to continuing this dialogue. Um, but I just really just want to acknowledge the time that I know this takes, uh, and I just appreciate that earnest engagement. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Ryan. And I'll just say, like, we've learned a ton from these conversations with you, uh, and I just really appreciate it. Uh, we, we would not be nearly as good as I hope it will be. Um, uh, without your input. So uh, thank you. All right. Um, excellent. Well, thank you all. really appreciate it. So I hope you all have a uh, rest of the, what I would say is Thursday, but it's actually Tuesday. So I got that one dialed in. Um, but uh, hopefully y'all enjoy the rest of your week and we'll talk to y'all soon. So thank you. Take care. <laughs>